Welcome to the Keen Run Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Keenan Yoga podcast is Shana Small, based in North Carolina, US. Shana has been practicing yoga and studying the Yoga Sutra since about 2001. Recovering from an accident whilst all you reflecting on the ableism inherent in most Ashtanga teaching, she was led to adopt her teaching towards inclusivity and making Ashtanga yoga open and accessible to all people, all students. She's a regular contributor to Yoga International OMSTARS and the Ishtanga Dispatch and teaches workshops on diversity and inclusivity in her own unique, engaging style. She's incredibly warm as a personality, as well as being quite challenging in her no-nonsense approach. She's uncompromising on the importance of philosophy underpinning her yoga practice, and she can be fierce and friendly at the very same time. Altogether, she's been a very fun and great guest to have on our podcast and spreading an essential message with conviction and re- relativity. So welcome, Ms. Shana, to the Keenan Yoga podcast. I'm really pleased to, to finally meet you. Hi, thank you, you for having me. <laughs> no, no one knows what to say there. It's like just silence. You <laughs> I, yeah, I forget that this is like, this is all audio because I can see you. So I'm like, I'm like, he sees me not in my head, but okay, no, I need to say no, I should, I should prep people to say like, hi, <laughs> but I was going to say that and people say, Nothing. <laughs> like, um, I, should, I should know after 60 podcasts. Um, so right, just give us some of your background about how you, you know, why, why you got into yoga, why you got into Ashtanga yoga, that kind of thing, you know, just a basic overview of, of your journey up to now with yoga. So I'm Shana Small and um, I started practicing yoga um, roughly 20, 20 years ago. And I was, you know, I got interested in it because it was starting to grow in popularity. And I like this idea of, you know, being able to um, to do something that's highly spiritual, but that also works the body. And, you know, that's what I came into it the way that most people do. Like mm, I, want, yeah. I want a nice body, um, but I also want to be spiritual. So I came into it that way. Right. And, you could have um, said it better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I was um, doing it at this gym and, um, and I got into it and the little, the lady that was teaching at the gym, she left. And so I was without a teacher and I was actually in college at the time. And my rhetoric teacher one day was like, told us he was an Yanger teacher and that he's certified by the Yanger family. He used to practice with um, BKS, was his teacher, this is a long time ago. Um, and, and so after class, I was like, oh, this guy can be my teacher. I'm going to learn yoga from this guy. Like he's the real deal. So I go up to my teacher, you know, my rhetoric teacher and I'm like, Hey, my professor. Rhetoric. Yeah. You're a rhetoric teacher. Yeah. He's You're... a rhetoric professor. What's that? So rhetoric is basically debating. So yeah, you bring right. up some type of topic. It might be, you know, something from Aristotle. It might be something, you know, very, you know, up to date. And then you're supposed to argue both sides and it's supposed to help you to find your ability to be intellectual and to think on your feet. And Fantastic. All that. It was really a fun class. Yeah. And so what um, were you studying? At Georgia State University. And what was your what was your major? My major was business. Business, because right. That's okay. what I was told. Night. Cool. Like, <laughs> but anyway, um, so this is during like, you know, in America, like you take like these core classes they make you take that have nothing to do with your major. So I was in that yes. part. 
<laughs> you have to understand that, yeah. Well, yeah. I know, you know, not to say the rhetoric wouldn't be good for business, but I guess you didn't. I mean, <laughs> let's, let's hear, let's look, carry on, carry on, I'm distracted. So, so, you, so you, found, you found the younger teacher? So I went right? up to him after class and I was like, I've been practicing yoga and my teacher moved and I really, can I, you know, should I come practice with you? And he looked at me, he said, no. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, no, you should not come practice with me. He said, you should go practice Ashtanga. He was like, you're young, um, got a lot of energy. And he was like, you should go practice Ashtanga. And then he told me about an Ashtanga studio in Atlanta, which that studio is not there anymore. Um, and the teacher there. And I went over there and started practicing Ashtanga. And that's, that's all she wrote. I mean, I loved it from the beginning. Like, I've never had a problem with it. I... I, I was like intrigued by all of the different postures and and it really like I never felt like overwhelmed by it. I never felt like um like I didn't belong. Like okay. I was super excited about learning it and I just jumped in head first. But after he told me that, and that's also my personality. Uh I am a head first type of uh person. And so when he was like, Do Ashtanga, I was like, okay. <laughs> and I, so I did Ashtanga and, and, and loved it. Right. I mean, that doesn't kind of marry up exactly to your, to your current kind of, you know, presentation of it. So what happened along the way that made you change your mind? Because it seems I still like you, love yeah, you have a Ashtanga. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. It's like what I told one of my teachers the other day, um, my teacher who's teaching me um, Sanskrit. I was like, you know, I didn't quit Ashtanga. Ashtanga quit me. Um, but it just got to the point where, um, so I had, I fell down, long story short, I fell down the mm -hmm. stairs. Um, and when I fell down the stairs, I, uh, bounced down the stairs on my sacrum and, um, all the way down to the bottom. So when that happened, I was terribly injured and I didn't know it at the time, but I had, um, sprained my ligaments. Um, and then also on top of the sprained ligaments, I also didn't know this at the time because I didn't have the x-rays. Um, I have something called lumbosacral anatomy on the left side, which is where my, um, I want to say whatever the last, uh, L, uh, four, whatever, is there L six, whatever the last, last little L at the bottom of your spine, what right. is it? Whatever that is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Whatever that is, it's it's combined with my sacrum, so it's all one unit. Versus on this side, and in, on a lot of people's bodies, it's your your sacrum moves apart from your from that from that part right. of your spine. But mine is yeah. all one thing. So that plus the fall, um, plus me overworking my spine for twenty years. Um, and you've been, practicing, you've been practicing up to 20 years before that. That was right. So, so, so you made some, you know, I mean, you, you were saying, I think I saw on one of your posts or somewhere, you, you were into advanced series, uh, of, you know, you, at, at this point, right? When that happened. Third series. Right. Uh huh. And um, so all of that created this perfect storm um, for me to have arthritis, for me to have all my, to have my disc eroded there. So there's like no, no adding there um um so it just got to the point where forward folding uh was incredibly painful um incredibly inflaming it made it so i could barely walk like i would be walking and all of a sudden i would like basically fall um, because my my sacrum the it would just die basically mm, um right and so I do still practice Ashtanga, but normally, honestly, I do second series and I do um, second series up to like, um, like right around leg, around uh, leg behind the head. I don't actually do leg behind the head. I do hip openers um, and I don't mm -hmm. do Kapatasana because that's too deep with what's going on with my sacrum right now. But I yeah. found that uh, opening up and back bends actually felt really good and flexion and forward folding actually did not. And so in order to be able to do all the things that I used to do in Ashtanga, I had to find different ways um, mm. to do them. So in comes the chair, yeah. in comes the use of all of these different tools. And then... Do you start, I mean, do you start that straight away? Or, did, or and what happened when it... I mean, it seems like a quite like a, a juncture, right? Like it didn't happen kind of slowly. It happened kind of quite 
quickly. Is that right? Relatively, it started. It it, it happened quickly because after that accident happened for a while, I was still trying to do um, right. a stunt the, the yeah, regular yeah, yeah. way because my whole entire life. Yeah, if I went you were teaching, primary, you were teaching at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my whole right. entire life. So everything was bound up into it. Right? Yeah, my whole entire life. If I went back to primary series, things would fix themselves. But it wasn't happening this time. Okay, right. It right, was right. getting worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's so, when I realized I had to do something different. Well, in this case, I mean, your story is super inspiring then for people that have had, I mean, because many people have had this kind of situation happen to them, right? Where something big happens, you know, and then they're not able to do what they were. I mean, you know, like I've done, I've interviewed Dave Christensen, for example, on the podcast, right? right? She had, a, you know, a, a big a crisis, you know, and, and she really frames it as a kind of dark night of the soul, right? Like, I mean, you know, for, for I mean, how did you deal with that? Did I mean, I don't imagine you popped up straight away with your chair and your blankets and everything. Like, you know, how, what was the process that got you into this? How did you find a way to this? There was a lot going on for me at the time. At the time, I was also yeah. breaking away from, um, yoga studios and like the yoga industrial kind of commercial capitalist complex in general. So it actually happened at the perfect time because I was already breaking away from what um, the West has deemed to be yoga. I was already moving away from that. So when this accident happened, it it really was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the thing that really pushed me over the edge and mm. I made a lot of moves at that time. But yeah, it just happened at the perfect time because I was already like in the dark night of the soul with just the yoga world in general. And that happening, I was like, this is the sign. And, and I just kind of completely moved out at that time. Okay. So but before we go on to talk about your accessibility, which I'm really kind of one reason, I'm, you know, um, the predominant reason I'm, we, we got together today. What was it that, that drove you away from the yoga scene when you talk about breaking out of the, the capsulist and what, what other terms were you using? Yes, uh, I mean, that yoga industrial, you... westernized Okay, complex. right, right. Um, so when I moved from Atlanta to Charlotte, there was no Ashtanga community. And so I've been working to set this community up. And, you know, and so I, I was teaching vinyasa at a vinyasa yoga studio. And so I was basically told that, you know, if you, you know, kick their butts, you teach them this asana really hard, then they will eventually be interested in the spiritual side of it. Because I've always at heart uh, been um, a little bit of a bhakti type person, very devotional because the way I was raised as Pentecostal Christian, and I'm not Pentecostal anymore. But because of that, I'm very devotional. Um, in the heart. And so mm. I was like, okay. You're, and so you're a bit disappointed when you came back week after week and the, they were just to ask you to kick their butt one more time. And, and harder. Well, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, that I think that resonates with a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, and harder. It was like it just kept getting crazier and crazier and yeah. crazier. It's like, okay, 90 degrees. Okay, now we're taking it to 95, 100. By the time I left, it was 105 degrees. 60% humidity. Um, you know, the classes were an hour and a half. By the time I left, um, they were an hour and then they had some that were 45 minutes. Um, when I first started, you would have like very long floor sequences where people would like just relax. And it got to the point where your floor sequence was like five minutes. Um, it, you know, Shavasana used to be seven minutes or more. And it got to the point where your Shavasana was like three minutes. Like it just kept getting crazier and crazier. And I kept, I found myself asking, this is never going to stop. They started adding weight classes and weights to the yoga practice. People were coming in with, to yoga with weights strapped to their ankles. Um, oh my God. It just kept, it just kept getting crazier and crazier. Even though in class yeah. I would introduce the sutras and introduce all this other philosophical stuff. And they were really into that stuff. But you had to kick their butt first and do all the crazy stuff. And mm-hmm. I was like, I can't. It's getting to the point to me where this doesn't feel like yoga anymore. And I can't be a part of this. I value yoga too much. I respect it too much to make it into an aerobics class 
with a triangle in it. Like I'm not going that route. And so I was already thinking that way when I fell down the stairs. And at mm. that point it was like oh, right, wow. see, how do the two things go together then? Accessibility and making I mean, because is there something in the yoga posture that makes it kind of ostensibly spiritual as opposed to doing something with weights in a hundred degree room that makes it non-spiritual, right? Like what's the essence that, that you were wishing for that you couldn't find in, in the in the hot, sweaty vinyasa class? Well, the yoga from the way that I learned it, and I understand it from, you know, my teachers and my study, it's supposed to move us in. The longer we right. do it, the more internal everything is supposed to become. So even when I was doing Ashtanga, it was it was very internal um, for me, this journey that I was going on and the way it felt and the breathing and the moving of the energy. So what I saw is that things were starting to move more externally. So instead of, you know, like with me, when, you know, when primary series got to be easy, it's not the word, but it started to get then, you know, that's a point where either I could continue to like post chase and push and try to make it crazy or I could come in and do my primary series. And because it's easy to my body, I can really go in, really go in. But this wasn't happening for a lot of people. It was like, this is easy. Can we add weights? This is easy. Can we take it up a few more degrees? This is easy. I need second series right now. This is easy. But my toe is tapping a little bit and let me start to get really obsessed with my toe coming off the ground and my pickups. Like I saw it start to just get people just were not going on the inside. They were just continuously right. looking mm -hmm. outwards and I could not be a, a part of, of that. <laughs> but opposed to um, just simply your own difficulties with the physicality and using the chairs and stuff and then the wall i saw a good one with the use picking your spot by the by the corner the other day which i kind of liked i mean, using the wall well do you, you found you didn't have a problem with the accessibility at that time you didn't have a problem with with feeling i mean because some teachers um someone has not come into mind but i don't I have, I have them in my mind assume that the yoga as it is is a kind of elitist a kind of, and I have heard you, you coin the word ableist in your stuff, right? But you didn't at that, at that time. That wasn't in your mind, or, or was it starting to come into your mind as well? That this is for a certain type of able body that's already, you know, already can do it. You know, I definitely drank the Kool Aid. So when I first started practicing Ashtanga, I was a little relaxed about it, uh, and then um, I don't know where the shift happened. I don't know if it was YouTube internet me listening to the wrong people i don't know but i did get very militant i'm not gonna lie right. i was a militant mm. teacher for a while mm. and i was very militant about my shunga for a long while um and i did go through that phase where i was like no this is it it has to be done like this anything else no blocks no straps i remember and i'm not going to name the teachers names but i remember there were teachers who were always using accessibility and i used to like light into these people and talk badly about these people because for some reason I got ridiculous and crazy. Um, hmm. And honestly, what's, what softened me and uh, which it, for a lot of people is the opposite. I went to, when I went to Mysore, hmm. uh, it kind of rocked my world because <laughs> in, in a good and bad way, I was really off center. Hmm. Uh, I went and I saw Sharat working with different people in different ways. And here I am, my ego got really lit up because here I am trying to do everything perfectly. Follow the count, follow the breath, every movement, perfect. And then I go to India, which, you know, felt kind of like Mecca. You know, it's not the same right. thing. I'm not trying to disrespect um, anybody else's religion, but it was kind of like mm -hmm. going to Mecca for yeah, yeah. Muslims. Yeah, cool. <laughs> it was like that for us Chinese. And I go to Mecca. And here is this guy doing different things with different people. And I'm like, just angry and upset. And, and then he, he, he was, he was jokey with me, but he was kind of rough on me. Like, you know, like there's that transition from, um, warrior one, um, no warrior two to chaturanga, um, where you can float up. Mm -hmm. I saw all these people jumping off of their back foot and I was taught differently by different teachers. Some were like, yeah, you can do the little jump off the back foot. 
to find the, and then some people are like, no, don't do that. It's a lift. And so I wasn't even paying attention. I was just doing whatever. And I do the little jump off the back foot. And he's like, who's your teacher? Like he runs over. He's like, who's your teacher? And I'm like embarrassed. And, and like, he just ran into me. And then there's people like a couple of poses, that, a couple of mats down for me. And they're like, Jumping on your back foot and we've had that experience. Yes, yeah, doing all kinds of things. Yeah. Said nothing to yeah. me, to yeah. them. And then another time with me, I was doing the um, the bakasana transition, like um, when you go from um, Bhujbadasana back to bakasana and go back. And he just like lit into me about wanting me to really hit that transition, really like lift up really be strong about it and pop back. And I'm looking over at all these other people around me. <laughs> They're like, why are you doing the transition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, why is he this way? Why is he doing this to me? Oh my God. And he like held me in primary series for two months. And I'm like, why is he doing this to me? So, and then I was watching, like, so my, I was just like totally off. confused. And I was yeah. like, what is the message that I need to be getting from this? Like I'm here and everybody's doing all these different things. He's working with them in different ways. And mm. I guess he saw that I could do these other things. So he was like really hard on me on those. And, not, mm. and I was like, what have I been doing? Like I've been teaching us as like, it's this militant thing with all these straight lines. And I thought that Sherrod would be militant and with straight lines. He, do, he is he is straight lines, but not the way I was. Um, and it really just kind of threw me off center. And then I started to, at the same time, still being militant when I got home, but kind of like being confused and starting to think again about Ashtanga and the way I learned it and what it was and what it could be. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Sounds like a fantastic trip. How it Although, well, but maybe not what you wanted it to be originally, but there's some fertile ground there, right? That confusion, you know, being confused about the whole thing. But it's funny because everyone comes back from my school with a different experience. And it's interesting that you read into it that it actually, as much as it's taught by the teachers that come back from my school to be this one literal, very polaric, you know, very specific practice, when you actually go and you see that there's all people, you know, being picked on or, or being encouraged to do different things almost, you know, and you're just like, well, you know, this is not what I was told back home. You know, so what? So, and, and and you took that. Where where was that in in the in the whole chronology of your uh, your your accident? And you know, was that that was a, around two thousand sixteen? My accident right. was probably maybe a year before COVID. Okay, right. So relatively recently. Okay. Um. Yeah. Very relatively recently, okay. and I for I was confused. Honestly, I stayed confused yeah. for a long time, and. One it's a good place um, to be. Yeah, one, one yeah, of my yeah, friends. Yeah. You might know him, um, Satinder. Um, do you know yeah, so yeah. yeah and know. Um, he told me, and I didn't listen to him. He told me when I was in India, he was like, "It's going to take you a long time to unpack what happened to you." And I was in a rush to unpack it all, and it did. He was right. It it like took me a long time to really unpack what happened um, mm -hmm. and to like integrate, and so. That took a long time, honestly. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're doing fantastically. And I think, you know, just encouraging everyone, that, you know, to, to make it accessible to everyone and also inaccessible in a way that's sustainable, right? Like, because things can be accessible, as you all know, but not necessarily sustainable, you know, accessibly, sustainably. So, right, you could do something for a year, but can you do it for 10, 20 years and still feel good and, and still be able to walk and not be, you know, kind of walking around, as David Swenson says, with a limp and smelling a tiger bar, you know, like, you don't, you don't, you don't, like, you don't want that. <laughs> so, I know so many people. Yeah, right. Or, or, yeah, we heard that, you know, when we get to my store in the 2000s of people going to practice. That was already a well-known thing. You know, people swallowing painkillers just to be able to do their practice. And it's like, well, but it's crazy, isn't it? As you said, you, 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 well, you know, and I was in the same, the same place, I have to admit as well, that you, you drink the Kool-Aid and, and for a while you, you kind of become crazy about it. And, and, you, and it's a process. I think a lot of people come out the other side. I was also a militant teacher that, you know, was very specific about how to do things and what was and wasn't Ashtanga Yoga. And, um, you know, it's, it's a process, you know, it's a process. Age and is the 
age will do it to you. Like when I see people, honestly, when I, I see people, life, that are very, life will do it to you. Life, when I see people that are you know, if, if age doesn't do it, just the circumstances of life will knock you, will knock those edges off you, won't they? And, yeah. But I mean, you know, and I say, it's wonderful that you've softened in this way and, and you're presenting it in a way that can be, I mean, because what you want is to be motivated in the postures. And if the posture seems out here and over, only for certain kind of bodies and certain kind of people, then no one's going to get into yoga. So I think you're, you know, you're bringing the Ashtanga yoga down to, to make it relevant for all people and say, well, I can do it, you know, um, which I, I find is wonderful. How, I mean, I've got a few questions, nevertheless, as I often do. Um, how, how do you preserve, I suppose two things I, I worry about. One, how do you preserve the breathing part of it? Well, I always had that problem with the yengar, right? Where you totally go to the cupboard, get the props. By the time you set them up and done all the prop work and setting up, it's like, well, where's the... You know, like, it's mainly about going to the cupboard and getting all the stuff. Um, and the and it's not about the yoga. And the second part is, um, what's the essence? I mean, you look at the posture and, you, and you're kind of... And you're very creative and you're looking at it. You go, well, how would I do this with this? I'd ask you this at the conference as well, I think. How do you preserve the essence of the kapitasana or the camel or whatever you're doing? So two rather difficult questions, I think. But I, so yeah. I still start with um, I still honestly start with asana. You know, in the West and in the modern yoga, um, that's really like the doorway. And so I still start there. So if I'm working with someone excessively because they've got something going on in their body and they're in pain, like that's that's the first thing they're thinking of is I want to not hurt. Um, so that's my first goal is to get them yeah. into something that is not going to make them hurt. And mm. it's also that's going to actually help them to heal. And then once mm. you're out of this place of pain, then you can focus on your breath. Because at first you're just in pain. You don't want to hurt anymore. And, you know, yeah. like doing excessive breathing and stuff right there is it, it's, it's like counterproductive. But then once you get someone knowing where they're going to go. They found the postures that feel good to their body and they know how they're going to they're gonna flow. Then from there, like really starting to focus again on the breath and the other limbs of yoga, you know, just like the way I approach teaching someone traditional shtanga with traditional counts and all the old school postures. Yeah. I'm going to start with, okay, let me get this person comfortable with whatever it is that we're talking about. Maybe it's sun A. We can get them comfortable with sun A. And then, okay, let's talk about how you're breathing here, inhaling and exhaling. I'm going to do the same thing with the, the tools. All right, let me get you set up nice in the chair or with your blog. All right, now you understand where to go. Let's bring in the breathing. Let's bring in, mm. let's take a look at where your eyes are going now. And over time, because that's the way yoga is supposed to be taught, honestly. Mm. Like, mm. honestly, it, it, it's not supposed to be, you come into, in my in my opinion, you come into the mindset of class and I'm going to teach you every single Thing all in this one day, like a student should mm. be dedicated enough for me to come them to come in the first day. I teach them how to use their block. Next time they come in, okay, let's look at this breath. Okay, next time they come in, let's look at these drishtis. Okay, next time let's put it all together. Like if you're uh, not with me long mm. enough to be able to do that, then that's that's their problem. <laughs> you know, like you leave it, but you leave it. But at first, I'm just trying to get someone to not be in pain. Um, and then from there, you can bring in the essence of the practice. And so I do, if someone is interested in Ashtanga, they come to me and they want to learn Ashtanga. I do try to give them something that if it doesn't look similar to the pose, it works the body in a similar way. Mm, okay. Like, mm -hmm. so if we're doing, uh, you know, a twist in Ashtanga, then I'm going to give them a twist in the chair. If they can only move from this part of their body up, it's not going to look like revolve side angle, revolve triangle. It's going to look like something. It's just going to look like them turning to the right and twisting in the chair. But that's as close as I can get them to revolve side angle, right? Mm -hmm. But for someone who can move their legs, maybe they're like me, their, their sacrum or their hip is just messed up, but they're strong and they can move their legs. Well, then I'm going to have them either stand up and use the chair for support, or I'm going to have them straddle the chair and actually be moving their legs, right? I might take them off the chair all the way and just use a block or a wall for support, right? It's just going to depend on the person, how close it's going to actually look like what we think a pose should look like. But I'm going to try yeah. to find the essence of that movement some way for that mm -hmm. person. Yeah. 
And you can do it in such a way that it doesn't get too choppy and too broken up. I mean, you're talking about the breath, but obviously you can't follow a literal count. I suppose that's, you know, as you say, when someone's in pain, who cares whether it's five or 10 counts, right? You just want to be able to breathe and, and inhale and exhale smoothly and evenly, which is, you know, which is, you know, essentially when we talk about breath, that's what it is really, you know, who cares? We know exactly how many counts of breath you do a forward folding really. Yeah. Um, I guess you probably would agree with that. Um, <laughs> what, um, what about the idea that, I mean, we, we, the original thing with the blocks and the props and stuff, what we were told and you would have been told it as well, is if you use a prop, you'll always need a prop. You know, you're relying on the prop and then you never make progress because you've got the thing and you never challenge yourself. And I suppose this is a twofold question as well, in a way. It's like, one, how do you get the tapas back into it? If you're, you know, when do you know when someone's just being quite a, a little bit like, you know, I don't want to say lazy, but you know, like, you know, they could try a bit harder and pull it out of the, out of themselves, right? Or when, you know, when someone's just using the prop and they look, come stuck on the prop, right? Like that, that's the worry, isn't it? Um, so, um, that's a lot of questions. Uh, let's see. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Well, you, know, people, oh, you don't have to give an answer, but they just. No, no, it's a lot of yeah, ways yeah, yeah. I can go with it. Um, okay, great, great, great. Some people will always need, they will always need a prop. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because people can feel shame if our teachers are just going up to us like, yeah, eventually we're going to take you off of this wall. But maybe I have vertigo and a bum ankle and there's that's never going anywhere. And I feel like you're pressuring me because you're like, trying to get me away from the wall when really the wall is where I need to be. So I think we have to be very mindful of this idea that of telling the student that eventually we are going to take you off, it, it, but they, that may not be what they need. So we have to figure out a way of speaking to them that doesn't make yeah. them feel bad about the fact that maybe they're going to, maybe they're going to need that wall forever. Um, and it's about the way we communicate with the student and know the student. Um, and then and it is challenging territory because, yeah, I mean, you have because we want to be challenged. And, and sometimes, you know, like I was, I remember being challenged by Shiraz a lot in my soul, right? And, and it kind of did bring it out of me a bit, you know. But on the other hand, I mean, you certainly don't want someone to feel terrible about themselves and then quit yoga altogether because they've been kind of shamed and, and you know, and then they maybe they need, do need that. So I don't know. Is there any, I mean, just kind of going into that further, yeah. is there any? signs or, or any practical advice you could give for a teacher to be able to kind of find or uh, you know kind of analyze to such a degree where they know when to challenge or when to or when to back off i mean in your so experience here's a second point i wanted to make um everybody's practice is personal like i remember Shrat in india saying even saying like some people only need you know sun flutes to find samadhi and some people need fourth series to find samadhi so the second point is it depends on the person. Maybe this person, some people don't need their practice to be hard right. in order to find the yeah. inner space, yeah. in order mm -hmm. to connect with who they are um, mm -hmm. and to find that moving meditation and maybe eventually find that samadhi. Some people don't need that. So I think that's another thing that I caution with teachers. It's like, who, who needs the class to be harder? You or them? Because right. maybe they don't. Maybe that, you know, that side angle, they've been doing the same one for 15 years and you're looking at it going, wow, they really are stronger and they could be doing more. But they're in that side angle, breathing, looking at their hand, just having this beautiful internal experience. To me, that's the yoga. I've, I've done my job. If they're there and they just they're having this beautiful internal experience. That's the yoga for me. So it depends on the student. Are they looking for it to be harder? Or not? I think that's I a think good point because to to I think the teacher can get, I think as a teacher, you can easily feel like, well, if everything's going well, it's like, well, your job's done. And you feel a sense of, I don't know, 
there's a concern, right? We want to keep someone with me and to keep giving them. We have to keep giving, 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 we're making, and therefore you assume or you, you kind of extrapolate the person, was it harder or they were in a new challenge, right? Because everyone, someone down the road is saying, well, you can do second series now, you can do third, and you assume that the, the, the teacher and the student wants that, right? So, I mean, so it kind of, you know, in terms of the corporate kind of yoga and world that's you're going the back to. teacher's ego, not the student. That's the teacher's problem. That has nothing to do with the student. And, and I'm guilty of this and I'm still guilty of this, this idea of I have to keep the student. Um, and so instead of being with them and giving them what they need, I'm trying in some way to keep them. And this is mm. changing how I deal with them. You, instead of being like, they may not need me anymore. Mm. Like I may not be the one for them. They may not need me anymore. And, and, and they need to, they can go. And I know that's hard because we have yoga studios and we have a struggle programs and mm. we want to keep them going. So there's like catch 22 of letting the students mm. go and also trying to keep them. It's hard, but I still mm. think that's our, our, our stuff. Like even mm. that discussion with ourselves of trying to keep them there. That's, that's still our, our stuff. So to me, it's like, it depends on my student. I'm going to keep in, in speaking to them and find out what are they looking for the practice? Are they looking to really push this body to the max? Because some people are, that's part of their experience and some people are not. So if they're looking to push the body to the max, if they're telling me that they're looking to eventually do a traditional Ashtanga practice, then yeah, I'm going to be watching for when they don't need the chair, watching for when they don't need a block. Like right. for me myself. So you're not going to keep them. You're not going to keep them on it. Like, even for me myself, even knowing what I know, I enjoy the traditional Ashtanga practice, and I'm looking for signs in my body that I can go back to that practice. They're not there right now, and so I'm not, um, and I may never. But for me, I do want to go back to that, so I look for those signs. So a teacher would need to talk to me and know. That, that that's what I'm looking for and work with me rather than putting their own stuff on top of me. Like, mm. oh, she should want this. Look how strong she is. I actually know a student who quit practicing in studios. They practice at home, but they stop practicing in studios for that reason. They're mm. extremely hypermobile, which means that yeah. their body can do a whole lot of stuff. And they did not want to do these things because they knew that this could put them in danger. But the teachers, wherever they would go, would see them and be like, wow, you can do all this stuff. And we constantly push them. And she would tell this teacher, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'm good. No, I don't. And this would happen everywhere. And eventually she stopped practicing in studios. So she was like, people see me as hypermobile Barbie. And they want me to do a practice that they want for their bodies. And mm. they're not listening to me. Well, also just to have the confidence to rest in the space of, of the relationship between the two of you, like the teacher and the, the student, and, and just be in that space and just see, you know, and also have the patience and the confidence that, that you know, you don't need to keep giving every day, right? The, you know, the two of you can go on in a, in a space and see what happens together, right? And you don't need, and neither person has to conclude or have the definite answer of what's going to happen, right? Yes. So, you know. But just to be in that space of not saying, well, I don't know exactly where I'm going to, you know, where you're going or where I'm going to go with you. But, you know, it's, I don't know, there's a bit of a give and take. And I think things have shifted as well from this way that you would have been taught and I was taught in a more pedagogic style, right? Like, here's the teacher and they kind of whip you into shape, right? Like, I mean, even, you know, BKS Yenga was called Bank Kick Slap Yenga, right? Because that was the way you just kind of, you got to kind of literally beat it into shape. And, you know, and that was kind of expected almost, right? And I think the, the balance has shifted and now, but it's difficult. And, and I don't know whether you have anything to comment on this. Is it possible, do you think, that the balance could shift too much whether the, the te- you know, now the student is in charge and the teacher who potentially has more experience has to follow what the student says, right? And that's, that's kind of my worry because I definitely go towards this side. But then I think at a certain point, well, probably I do have some experience or something to say, and yet it should be their practice and it's their body. And we know that the person theoretically knows their body best. But on the other hand, an objective view and an outside view and a more experienced view, maybe, what do you do then? Yeah, um, that's essentially what happened in the vinyasa style. It got to the point where we were turning up the heat because the students were asking us. Mm. Even though, honestly, a lot of the teachers who were there at the time did not even really enjoy that type of practice that we were doing when they practiced on their own. Their practice was slower, more breathing, 
less heat. It was completely different, but we were teaching something else because that's what the students wanted. So it got to that point and it got very um, unbalanced. Um, so when I think about any relationship, it's just that it's a relating between the two. And so I think we have to be very clear um, what our relationship is to our student, what we're here for and what they're there for. Um, and the teacher and student relationship has to be very clear. So to me, the teacher is your teacher right now because they know maybe just a smidgen more about triangle than you, or they know a smidgen more about second series than you or about back bending. They know just a little bit more. And because they know just a little bit more, when it comes to the yoga, there does have to be a little bit of, of trust and for lack of a word, better word, a deferential type of, of a relationship, because if you've taken them on truly as your teacher, you're trusting that they know a little bit more about side angle than you so that you can safely explore the, the difference between what you know about side angle, that gap and what they know and grow mm. into that gap. So there does have to be a little bit of trusting of the teacher and the teacher's journey and their knowledge. Um, and then the student is there to say, OK, when I do this with my body, it feels this way. Oh, that doesn't really feel that good. And from there, that's where the, the teacher is listening and deferring back towards the student. Oh, when I tell them to do side angle this way, it's hurting their hip. Right. So taking the knowledge of the teacher and the knowledge that the student has of their individual body. Right. Mm -hmm. The teacher has the knowledge of the side angle, but the student has the knowledge of their body. And then we're bringing them together to make the side angle that's perfect for that student. So that's how I see it. They have the knowledge of their body and how it feels. We have the knowledge of the posture and we put that together um, versus the student totally leading. And you're looking at them and you're like, I don't know if this is going to go well, <laughs> but you're continuously <laughs> like giving them more. And you're kind, of, you're kind of enabling this kind of crazy behavior. Or it can go the other way, right? I mean, that's, that's the paradigm shift to, and a reaction to what was before, which is you come to the class and, you know, like you kind of literally, uh, there's teachers who will kick you out if you don't do exactly what is told to you, you know, in the way that it's meant to be done. Absolutely. But, I mean, so... What do you think, I mean, going back to yoga studios, and I don't know whether you're teaching in person now, but um, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of methods or parameters can you put around it to change this discourse, right, in terms of the language or in terms of, the, you know, how you use a classroom mm -hmm. so people feel included? And, you know, because it is very off-putting for a lot of people. They don't feel welcome. They don't feel that it's for them. Yoga is for them, you know, which is such a shame. So this is one of those things kind of like systemic racism where it's like it's a huge thing. And right. You do the little bit you can do to like chip away. And yeah, that's sure. basically what I tell teachers. If you're still working within a studio, you still own a studio. You're going to do little things over time to chip away because to, to switch overnight won't work. Um, it's, it can actually be traumatizing to the students and we don't want to traumatize our students in the yoga class. It can actually be traumatizing to walk in and be like, we're changing everything. And, and so it's this slow movement towards what you really know and understand to be yoga. So it really depends on who I'm talking to. Like if it's an Ashtanga teacher, I'm going to be like, well, can you find agency by listening more to the student? Can you um, let them know that it's okay to listen to their body and to move the way um, um, that they see fit within um, a particular posture? Um, so that could just be the start of it. And then from there, you start like really removing that uh, uh, patriarchal, capitalistic, uh, ableist, <laughs> racist, mm colonizing like that's a whole lot of stuff that we're trying to take out of yoga right mm -hmm. but we start just really slow with little things agency is a big thing just letting the students mm -hmm. know that um it's okay whatever they feel and making them feel comfortable talking to you about whatever it is they feel by creating this environment where you're completely open um to discussion and to talking and it's not like this my way or the highway that would be the first thing I would do for a strong people. 
And then were any words you like to use or any ones that you don't like to use that you know you don't like in terms of describing or the posture or cueing or this kind of thing? So I'll give examples. Lately, I have been teaching straight Mysore style. So that gives uh, me the ability to speak to each individual person and use the words that I need to use for that individual. So when I teach Ashtanga, um, I let people know that there is a traditional uh, practice that goes with Ashtanga, but you can move however you want um, for your body. So all I do is just give them different variations. And the variations don't have to have a name, right? We don't have to use the word modification. We don't have to use the word variation. Right. We yeah. can throw those out. That's where the problem mm -hmm. comes in. So I can say, you know, Trikonasana, eight come inhale, step your arms up, step out to the right, reach mm. your arms out, exhale, spin your foot towards the right, right hand down, grab your back, your big toe, left arm up. Or you could take your right hand and place it on your thigh, or you could take your right hand and place it behind your foot on a block. I don't have to say uh, the next option, or you can modify yeah. this triangle by putting your mm. hand on a block. Like a lot yeah. of the words we're using, we yeah. don't even need them. You can just be like, okay, try and go grab your big toe or put your hand on your shin or put your hand behind you. Like you don't have to say stuff like, if you're a beginner, put your triangle <laughs> hand on your shin. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, you don't have to say that stuff. You can mm -hmm. just give the options, right? So it's like people came over to my house to eat. Um, yesterday and I have like six different friends. All I did was lay out stuff, right? So we had barbecued outside, you know, these vegan burgers, everything's vegan. So it's like, you can have the hot dog, you could have the burger, you, there's lettuce, there's tomatoes, there's onions, there's, you know, chips over here. Just lay the food out. I didn't go, Brilliant. if you're really, really strong, you might want to yeah. try this spicy hot dog, but if your stomach gets really messed up, try the mild hot dog. If you don't yeah, really yeah, like yeah. a lot of spice, don't put the, I didn't, that's all you got to do. You don't have to say any mm -hmm. of that stuff. Just lay it out, lay it out. You know, reach your arms up, palms touch, look up, or take your hands apart. Like you don't have to like add all of that extra, you know. I yeah, I mean, looking back and looking at why this would have set, you know, why would people have used these terms like modification in the first place? I mean, it goes back to this idea that, well, we're trying to challenge ourselves, right? Or be put to some degree in an uncomfortable, you know, like, you don't want to make it too comfortable, but, you know, it's such a fine line. I mean, and I don't have the answers of speaking to you about this, and I probably you don't either exactly, but because there's something about being humbled in the practice, right? Like, to get out of your, you know, your own kind of self belief in a way, right? You can do anything. Right? <laughs> like, on the other I hand, find that if you give people options, people who are people who are feeling like this is easy, you think people are able to, to kind of define for themselves? They would, they would, they will understand what to do. Yeah, that's what options. I see. If I tell that's, somebody, right. tell people to put their hand on their shin for triangle. And then I give yeah. them the, uh, the option of also grabbing the big toe. Usually I see people grab the big toe and like play around with that for a minute. And usually most people okay. stay with that and then they might right. come back up. But most people, if I give different ways of doing it, they will try them and you'll see okay. their mind working Fantastic. Fantastic. and they'll like start to go down to grab their toe. They're like, oh, no, I shouldn't do that. And they'll come back up. And if they can grab their toe, they'll grab it. Like I don't. I honestly don't experience people who I honestly just don't experience people who uh, are not trying to challenge themselves. Like right. not in a Shanga class. I yeah. really just don't see that. Like usually if someone comes so to a vinyasa so or generally a you're trying to get them to kind of back off a bit. Yeah. I, I, and if somebody's backing mm -hmm. off, it's usually because there's something going on with them. But people mm. don't come to Ashtanga and to Vinyasa to back off. So if they do, then that, that is a really strong signal to me. But I, I just uh, honestly, I don't. I've never seen that happen where someone who wanted to be challenged did not take the challenge. Mm. If they didn't take it, it's because they didn't want it for whatever particular reason. And I honor that. But usually, if I'm like, yeah, you know, oh, that that camel looks really good. I think you might be able to do kapitasana. 
it's rare for me to hear somebody be like, no, I just do not want the challenge of cup of taco. They're usually like, okay, let's, let's try it. Like, I'm like, and if somebody doesn't do competition, it's because they've tried it before and they know it didn't work and then they'll tell me. <laughs> but like, mm-hmm. usually if I'm like, oh, that, 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 your lobby look great. Let's try a competition. They're like, okay. I've never heard anybody go, I want to keep easy. I want to stay at Lagu and Camel. <laughs> like, it just mm-hmm. doesn't, it's not like, and if they do, it's a reason. They're like, yeah, my shoulder feels funny. So I'm going to stay at Lagu. I'm like, cool. Mm-hmm. But anybody who has their body feels good, they'll be like, okay. Why not? Like, I just, I haven't yeah. seen it. <laughs> and you mentioned a, a, a couple of big well, I mean, colonialism, racism, systemic um, racism and, and, and patriarchal. Can you say how, in a very, very brief, I suppose, you know, little sound bite, uh, how, what you mean by that in terms of yoga? When you, you know, having, having experienced those, those, those yourself firsthand. The yoga that we have in the West has just been through a lot of changes. And some of it had to do with the history of, like, the people who made yoga yoga popular in the West were practicing in India during British colonization. Um, And we can act like that didn't touch it, but from the research and the things that I've seen, it touched it. It, 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 it shifted it. And there's always people in there's, and this is, doesn't go for everything. I'm talking about this Mm -hmm. Westernized physical yoga that we have over here. You always have schools of yoga that kept their authenticity. Um, But a lot of these yogas that we practice here in the West were deeply touched by um, colonization. And so you start to do that research and start to look into it and start to see how it was changed and how it was was affected. And then as it came to the West, the colonization continued and meaning that um, the, I own this, it's mine and I'm going to do whatever I want with this. That's kind of like the colonizer attitude is that mm. it's it's mine now and I'm going to do what I want with it and that kind of continued as it got more and more popular in the west and part of like decolonizing it is going back to okay the yogis who started this tradition what were their thoughts around it why did they start it what was the purpose of it how did they go about it and they had a lot of knowledge because this has been around for so long because it works so who, who am I to say that because I'm practicing it now that I have all the answers, right? That's getting outside of that colonizer. It's mine. I claim it and I'm going to do what I want to with it. Mm-hmm. It goes back to, mm-hmm. no, some people were doing this before me and they had great success. And this technology is extremely old. It's made people healthy. It's enlightened people, awakened about love, peace, mm-hmm. this earth. So let me go back and understand why they were practicing it and look at how it changed and shifted and then have respect for the whole process. And then we go back to yeah. decol- that's the decolonizing. And the patriarchal- so it's contextualization, really. Finding a context to what you're doing rather than going, well, I, I'm just going to wear dreadlocks or something without understanding like the significance of what, like, what you're taking your tiny little bit and going, well, I want that. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. And the patriarchal stuff, like, uh, also happened around that time. Um, you know, there, it, there are parts of yoga like Tantra and, you know, you have Sri Vidya, which is very female, um, divine based. And, but that didn't really be, get picked up as much as the more, um, like, um, the militaristic stuff came about because at the time, it, it, this is a whole, Anyway, that whole thing started to get really popular because, you know, the British was there and people did work, did feel like they needed to be stronger. Then you have muscular Christianity, which is a whole separate thing. There was so much going on that made it till where yoga started to lose a little bit of that feminine quality that it always had and went more towards this masculine quality and more patriarchal uh, in the way that it went. And so like breaking, looking at all of that stuff, and it, that takes a lot of work. A lot of people are not going to want to do that. I am also a, a bit of a yani as well. I, I love knowledge and looking at it and unpacking it. And that's what I've been doing. But mm. like 
yeah, all of that stuff is going to be a challenge in the yoga world to find our balance. I think we've lost our balance. I honestly do. Um, and it's not just a yoga thing. It's a world thing. You know, look at global warming. Yeah. We've got warming. We've got an ocean that's on fire right now. Um, you know, Canada, half of Canada was on fire. Like you've got all, you got record highs um, happening right now. And you're right, out of balance. So it's not just yoga. It's just like humanity in general has gotten out of balance in so many ways. And then we've got to return back to like the indigenous ancestors. They knew how to balance things back out. They did. Even in yoga, they knew, they understood the different qualities of the energies and how to balance them. And we just lost it. So as a whole, we need to go back towards balance. And there's no easy way to do it, right? There's no like, it's all um, going to take work. And if we love yoga, um, we might take that on. So along those lines, like, I mean, I know that you, you try to actually make accessible things like the yoga sutras and the yoga philosophy as well. That, you know, it's not just physical. That you're actually trying to bring those down to the people, right? Like, and make them, you know, applicable, relevant, right? Like, yeah, you're, you're talking along these lines now. I mean, how can you give kind of a like an overview of how you try and present that stuff so it's you know relevant to people in Charlotte, you know, in the I modern day? That it's always been relevant. Like, it's the Yoga Sutras and the uh, Bhagavad Gita. To me, has never not been relevant. But what happened is we took those texts and we like colonized them. We took them and tried to soften them up and took them out of cultural context. And as we started to soften them up, they kind of don't have, they start to lose their meaning because we're wanting them to be like this thing where anybody can, where they don't um, make us uncomfortable. We're trying to make everybody comfortable. And in the Yoga Sutras and like the Bhagavad Gita, these are not books that are meant to make people comfortable. They're books that are how, meant to how, make how people so, How are we softening them up? Um, like the Yoga Sutras is a book about samadhi. That's what it's about. It's a book on samadhi. But usually when people talk about it, they don't talk about samadhi in, in, in most yoga classes. Um, they pull like the eight limbs out, which is a very small part. And then they usually don't even pull the eight limbs. They pull like yamas out and niyamas. Um, and, and then they take those and try to make them into 10 commandments and then, then try to soften up what they feel is the 10 commandments. And like, and well, actually there's a strong argument to say that the eight limbs, the, that the whole eight limbs thing is an interpolation. It wasn't originally there in the text. It was actually put in later. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah so like, like just taking yeah. in all the stuff and let's just soften it up and, Ahimsa just means be a nice person, right? And when I say stuff like Ahimsa is just being a good person, being and not talking about the fact that good is relative, right? And that's why in yoga, it's not really about being good. It's about being present. And from that being present, you're able to open up and see everything for what it really is. And from being able to see everything from what it, what it is, you can start making decisions from that place. But those decisions are not necessarily good, bad. They're not labeled that way. So if I say be a good person, that can mean anything to anybody. Being a good person to me might be being an anti-racist um, kind of social justice person. And so to somebody else, being a good person may mean that, oh, my uncle's telling this off-color racist joke, but I'm going to be peaceful and be a good person. And I'm just going to sit here and smile. I'm being good. I'm not causing any strife. I'm being peaceful. And we both got these different ideas. So saying that softens up the message and it makes it so that people really don't go deeper. Like, so when I talk about yoga sutras, if we go deep into ahimsa, I describe ahimsa as doing the least amount of harm possible for you. And you've got to go deep, deep down and ask yourself, when I purchase this eight, my 80th pair of yoga pants, how is that harmful? What's the effect on the world as I do this? If I'm sitting here listening to this off-color joke, am I really being doing the least amount of harm? How am I contributing to racism by just sitting here? Like, that's where I take people. It's like, I'm not going to just be like, oh, Ahimsa, be nice to people, be a good person. Next, no, I'm going to be like, okay, we're, I want you to unpack it. And you can spend your whole life asking yourself, am I doing harm by 
drinking this water and holding this cup. Like that's where I go with people. It's like you ask yourself mm-hmm. about everything that you do. And to me, that's how I make it applicable. I don't try mm-hmm. to make it nice and watered down. I force people to actually look at the harm that mm-hmm. they do in this world unconsciously and consciously. That to me is making it applicable without it's watering like the, it down. The hard and the soft. You're very soft on people, and then it's very tough on them. Soft on them physically, tough on them emotionally and mentally. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been wonderful to chat with you, and I just, I, 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 I don't always do it, but I'll do it today. Um, as, a, as a finishing little little thing that I've often done on the podcast, give me one inspiration and uh, one guilty pleasure. <laughs> just a fair, yeah. One inspiration and one guilty pleasure. Like, I'm constantly inspired. I've never had that problem. Like, just living is inspiring to me. Like, Can you think of any place, book, person, anything, the music even? You know? um, um, gosh, um, so many, like the Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, um, the Dalai Lama, um, like all of that stuff inspires me nature just looking outside and i love going outside in my backyard and just sitting like that makes me feel inspired like i am this world to me puts me in awe like i don't really need to look further than this room for me to find inspiration because i am in awe that i'm on this planet that's spinning around in space and it's being held up by gravity <laughs> and like it's it's amazing to me. So it sounds like it sounds like you don't need any guilty pleasures either then. Oh I do have those. You enjoy, uh, yeah. Well I wouldn't say guilty. Guilty, but I do have pleasures that no, I know. No, it's a silly term. Yeah. I have pleasures that I know I, I have to pull back from. I right. I love sugar. So I love sweets. I like cakes and chocolates and donuts and uh ice cream and, and all of that stuff. So sweets are my thing, but having arthritis now because of my injury and the disc space erosion, that type of stuff messes me up and inflames me. So that's why I would say it's a guilty pleasure. Like I know right. I don't have a lot of it, but I love it. Oh, well, now and again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, it's been wonderful to have you. It's very good to be on. here. Absolutely. Thanks, Shana. <laughs> Thank you.